which happened in um, October '96, and then for the first year or two, it just looked pretty messy. I agree, it was covered in mud. Um, it did smell in a muddy kind of way. It wasn't unpleasant, but um, it, it shocked a lot of people. I think to see it like that. Um, but after about two years, it started vegetating, um, getting a green cover, particularly in the summer months. In the, in the winter, it was still just mud. Um, and then within about five years, it was colonising properly. Um, when the sea first came in, in, in uh, 1996, it was pretty dramatic. It cut a huge channel uh, instantly. And um, it really gave an idea of the power of the sea to see something like that, because I, I'd worked there for some time, but 10 years probably, and um, I went down the next morning, and one section of the beach had moved 100 metres inland. So that was dramatic uh, to see that, because... Um, the seas on the Bristol Channel aren't as rough as on the south coast. Uh, we don't get such big waves. They're pretty big, obviously, that night. And for the next few days, it was very much uh, um, in a state of flux. It was changing the whole time. And the difficulty we had there was that the, the old freshwater lagoon had been drained in the past, uh, in Victorian times. So a number of big drainage channels cut through it. And the base of the uh, lagoon was much higher than the most of the big tides, not the big spring tides. The big spring tides would cover it. And so initially, the, the, it, the change was, it was rapid at the, the front of the breach, where the sea was affecting it most, but not so much on the freshwater lagoon, because there was great beds of clay that the sea had to get over to start working it. But as the big spring tides happened, once every six weeks or something, um, this clay was gradually removed, gradually worn down, worn down, worn down all the time, leaving a huge step-like structure. It, it was called lately the Niagara Falls because it looked a bit like that. When the water came in, it couldn't escape quickly enough. And, uh, that, was, that was pretty dramatic. And, uh, then that, that cut through gradually until the sea reached the old um, drainage channels, the exact same level as those. And at that point, the equilibrium changed, and the tide was able to come in and out, whether it was an April spring, it made no difference. Obviously, on the spring, it covered a much bigger area, but it still came in even on the small tides. And from that point on, um, it, it developed more rapidly, certainly in, time, in terms of the plants colonising, because I think up to that point, it was too, too dynamic for anything to get a foothold, quite frankly. And also, for in those early times, the birds were completely thrown, because they didn't know quite what was happening. The breeding bird success uh, dropped. Um, for a number of years, uh, but since then has picked up because we have a lot of shell duck at Porlock and they just couldn't get used to these big tides coming in. Um, the rabbits were wiped out so they couldn't use the rabbit warrens. Um, but now they're beginning to come back as a breeding bird again and, and red shank are back now. Um, and because the shingle has stabilised either side of the breach, uh, we are getting oyster catchers and um, probably ring plover, I think, breeding there as well. So after what? 10, 12 years, it is settling down now. There were about 12 to 14 habitats, distinct habitats, ranging from coastal grassland to um, brackish lagoons and freshwater reed beds and so on. Immediately following the breach, it crashed to about four, um, which everybody was shocked about. And the, the key, I think the key thing to that um, and how we move forward was the fact that Natural England, um, prior to the breach, it, it, they designated it as a triple SI, and it was a biological triple SI. And that held us up because people kept saying, how can you have a triple SI when you've lost all the habitats? So naturally we were very canny and they changed the designation to a geomorphological triple SI, which played into our hands, or at least those that were looking to work with natural processes. That's what it was all about. And now it's become known as a, a really good geomorphological site. It's very dynamic. It draws a lot of people um, to the new habitats because we've, now got, we've actually now exceeded the old number of habitats. I think we've got about 15 now, so which is wonderful. Um, but also the, 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 the geology of the place, the fact that it is so dynamic, also uh, gives a lot of interest to people. They can see it changing every day. And it's quite exciting, actually, particularly in the winter. It draws a lot of people in the winter. Yeah. One positive side effect of, of the breach that we hadn't predicted was the sudden availability of a lot of archaeological evidence, which um, this was um, artefacts and material that had been overlain by... Um, silts um, and clay that suddenly became exposed to the sea and the sea started clearing these places so we found initially we found a lot of um, irrigation channels which we think probably date from the 18th century perhaps even earlier 
Um, and then bones started appearing. Um, initially just um, probably sheep or goat's bones. Again, we're not sure of the date, probably 16th century, 17th century. And then most exciting of all, as the clay cut down really deep, um, we had some massive bones appear, um, vertebrae um, and ribs and pelvis. And it turned out to be an aurochs, uh, one of the last wild cattle that used to roam the country, five and a half thousand years old. So that was amazing because we then, we made quite a big play of that. We, we got it into the business centre, we got the school out and they had a special arts week where they created a, a life-size aurochs based on these bones. It's a massive great thing, not exactly realistic, but um, mm -hmm. very colourful. Um, but that was good, it, it got the school involved as well. And since then, the, I think um, all the time now there's new archaeology being found. Um, we've done a lot of um, test boring down through the, the, um, the sediments as well to find out more about how the bays um, changed over, over the centuries. Um, but as, as the front of the, the sea develops, where, where the breach comes in on the clay, that's always turning up new things. I mean, you just never know what's going to be there. There's a lot of um, petrified wood appearing now, which needs to be dated. We've got large collections of it, but uh, it all costs money, so it'll take a while.